So in, a, in addition uh, to practicing law at price zero and making it up on volume, uh, part, of, uh, par part of our process is uh, that we also, because we work for free, we work very fast and we try and be extremely responsive, unlike certain other kinds of lawyers who need you to come back and pay for more clarifications for everything you say. It doesn't do us any good, so we try and say it right the first time, and then they won't come back, which at price zero is the correct answer. Therefore, I like to give answers to questions immediately, and I like them to be complete and absolute and to leave no space. And as it happens, as I say, um, so, so, so I should read, because bank executive titles are the things you should read off pieces of paper. I'm going to get this wrong. Keith Agassim is Senior Vice President and Associate General Counsel for Global Operations, and what is the other part before technology. we get to into, ah, Technology and Global Operations, <laughs> and uh, Global Intellectual Property for Bank of America. America, so you can understand why the title is so long because the bank is so big. Uh, also, uh, also uh, an alumnus of Columbia Law School, which in this room is the most important point. Uh, formerly of what was Ropes and Gray before it was Ropes and Gray when it was Fish and Neve, um, which in my childhood when I was a kid, IBM lawyer was the only law firm I knew that could bill more intensively to IBM than Cravath. So, so, so Keith comes from places where money is like Columbia Law School and uh, Fish and Neve and Bank of America and what he thinks about is these questions of global IP and compliance, and your question is about to be answered by the experts. So Keith, I turn it over to you. Sure, thanks. Um, so you know, I think what's interesting, uh, particularly for people that are not you know, in banking day in, day out, is that um, there's a, a dichotomy that I think you see in, in the financial services space, which again, if you're not there, may seem a little bit like a bipolar situation. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have you know, every day, as Chris mentioned, there's new announcements about new proof of concepts that are being tried by the banks, a lot of experimentation, whether it be in payments, settling trades, letters of credit, trade finance. Um, you know, the regulators themselves are out there touting how great this could be. You know, yesterday the OCC announced that they're going to have, a, you know, a new division focused on, on fintech. Um, CFPB has lauded blockchain and the opportunities there to faster payments, lower fees, more transparency for consumers. And so if you just look at that, you say, hey, this is great. The regulators are all behind this. They want this to happen. Um, smooth sailing. I, I think where the dichotomy comes in, there's always that tension, right? There's a tension between wanting the innovation, wanting you know, what's good for consumers, the public the financial system, with the regulators need to ensure kind of the safety and soundness of the financial system. And so you, know, you take all the positives and all the accolades, and if you just looked at that, you assume regulations are not a problem. Um, I think what's, what's instructive, there was a speech two weeks ago um, by one of the Federal Reserve governors, uh, Bernard, and she said some interesting things. You know, she talked about innovation and how, you know, what blockchain could do to revolutionize the industry. It could make faster payments. You could lower fees, uh, more transparency. But then she went on and spent most of her speech talking about the need to make sure there's, we ensure the safety and soundness. You know, she talked about long established guardrails, which I think is translating into regulation. Yeah. Um, she, you know, she talked about the need for technology firms and banks to ensure that they're managing risk appropriately. Again, translate that to the regulations. Um, what's interesting is she, and she went on, she kind of went beyond. So normally it's kind of safety and soundness is kind of the core of, of financial regulation. And she talked about, you know, the question with, with blockchain will be, does it increase the risk or decrease the risk compared to what we have today, which is normal. She went on then and talked about two additional risks, which kind of new, new, new take on this. So not only does it increase or decrease risk, but does it increase or decrease the transparency of the risk? And who bears that risk between the banks, technology providers, and end users? So, um, you know, I, I think kind of the, the take home message in the regulation question is that while there's certainly encouragement, I think at the end of the day, safety and soundness is what the regulators, that's their job, that's their responsibility. And so, whatever happens with blockchain, however it develops in the financial space, 
I think you have to keep an eye on what the regulations require. So what, what has happened so far, if I can summarize this before I, I, I bring another big gun onto the turf, that what has happened so far is we've established, I hope, this. Um, there is another paradigm of how software works in the world coming into existence. That paradigm has to do with self-authenticating information meant to be shared whether shared publicly or shared among a closed group of partners, the point about this information is that at one and the same time it requires and enables trust. Uh, and because it both requires trust and enables trust, it creates uh, both enormous efficiencies in trust and also great difficulties uh, in understanding where it should be used and what the risks are of using it. But this approach to making software, that is to say we have a way of uh, authenticating information on its own face that can be shared, is going to become as important to the way software works in the world as another idea, let's call it relational databases, uh, began to be in the 1970s. We have ways of storing and sharing information, but they're extremely different now. And the technical design paradigm is uh, now also a set of social consequences, which we don't quite understand. And there are a lot of use cases, but exactly what are they? Uh, what, what Keith has just said at the beginning of his contributions to this, as far as I am concerned, is now what we really have to recognize is that because this comes from money and is about money, uh, the initial forms of skepticism have to do with regulatory questions about whether you're about to blow out the economy or improve the economy. Are we increasing productivity or are we creating a DAO that could turn out to be a, a big problem? Uh, back in the early 1990s when uh, I was working to free encryption, which everybody else knew was a really bad idea, um, and therefore to create electronic commerce, which everybody knew would be a really good idea, but they weren't willing to have encryption in order to get it, God knows what would have happened if they hadn't gotten encryption over their wishes. But back when I was trying to work on this problem, uh, one of the people uh, that I worked with was a cryptographer in California named Hal Finney, who was very important to the creation of version one of PGP. Uh, and if I had to tell you who I most suspect of being any particular part of Satoshi Nakamoto, it would be the late Hal Finney. Uh, and the evidence I would offer you is that the first transaction of Bitcoin, uh, Hal Finney was a counterparty in. Um, so the records say that, unless somebody has adjusted history in order to come uh, over the prehistory of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, the point about this, of course, is that it was money from the beginning, and it was... Um, I, 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 I know that when Chris says anarchist in that tone of voice, he's not trying to offend my clients. Um, uh, but let's face it, it was anarchism and money from the beginning, and that means there's going to be a radical degree of doubt about all sorts of things, which I thought Chris has very well expressed, and which anybody who works for a major money center bank doesn't want to have to get close to. Uh, and uh, we have Columbia alums all over, including the former New York State Banking Commissioner who first had to think about Bitcoin. And uh, we all know that everybody is going to be thinking about this shortly. In fact, I was sitting here uh, next to my uh, colleague Conrad Johnson and wondering whether anybody was going to have the heart to go and tell the securities teachers upstairs that they have no idea how the stock market is going to work in six years. Um, we, we are going to change all this and it's going to be a very complicated business and there's going to be a lot of skepticism uh, on the part of regulators who both do want it to work because it could be so wonderful and are afraid that it's going to blow fuses they don't understand. Chris, I, I just want to add and again, we, you know, sort of following up on the open governance aspect and, and why it's so fundamentally important that we do this in open governance and that is because we actually are trying to engage the regulators in this process as well. Right, as we evolve and develop the software um, in the Hyperledger community, certainly we want to engage and have the regulators and uh, the governments and so forth all be part of this whole conversation. Which means it has to be open because otherwise we could brief the regulators but then we'd have to kill them, right? Or yeah. we'd have to send Goldman Sachs alums to be the regulators because they would be the only people we could trust. That's a, another part of, uh, of this problem. So, so can, yeah, can please. Can just jump in that the open governance thing and just to kind of um, give kind of, again, the, the, the bank perspective. And I think 
you got to find the right balance and tension, right? Because, you know, again, from the regulator's perspective, if you're dealing with financial infrastructure, that's what you're talking about, they want to know that in the event of a crisis, right, there's somebody accountable, someone that is on the hook to get that back up and running. And so you look at some of the existing regulations out there. So the SEC, for example, has some um, uh, recovery time objectives that came out shortly after September 11th. And depending on how big of a market player you are, if, you're five, if you take 5% of any market, any, any securities, any, any equity market, there's a two-hour recovery time objective, right? The, the latest cyber rules just came out last week, the proposed rules, two-hour recovery time objective, right? If you have completely open governance, you're never going to be able to achieve that. So I think it's... Uh, I, I'm talking about the governance of creating the software, not... But, but to that I think it was point, to fixing yes, it, right? That, if there's a problem in the software, you've yes. got to have governance to fix it. Right. So, so if, if that exchange uh, gets put in our larger sense, what we are now saying is we, we know we have to have openness in the way we construct this technology. It is not mature technology. We're going to have to change it as we use it in order to deal with desperately complicated problems that most of the people responsible for taking political heat for will not know how to solve. Uh, and nobody wants to hear that the way this is done is on a Debian mailing list. Um, and they're right, except, of course, that we're still anarchists and we actually still do believe that, that freedom is important to all of this somehow. So the good news is that the people who are going to cause all of this to fall into place are neither anarchists nor compliance types. They're investors, and um, uh, they want to do other things with this, and they are going to define in some fundamental sense how a lot of this happens because their investments are going to be about the sequencing with which it happens. When I am teaching l law students or young lawyers about strategy, I explain to them that good strategy knows what's going to happen next, but that really good strategy knows in what order it will happen. Because until you know in what order things will happen, you are not actually making strategy. And in the technical economy of innovation in the United States and therefore the world, uh, the people who de de determine the sequence are, are known to of others as the Viet Cong. And um, they make decisions for their own reasons. Um, it, nowadays, as you probably know, when a telecommunications company wishes to innovate, Having exported all its innovative people, it goes and buys something for $85 billion and hopes that there is some innovation in there. This is not always how it was. Um, when we had a telecommunications monopoly in the United States, it, it did a lot of innovative thinking for, to which we owe stuff like Unix and C and a whole bunch of innovation we are still living off, which occurred at Bell Labs, uh, where innovation and telecommunications were not absolutely incompatible. And Brad Burnham, uh, uh, who will determine an awful lot about the future of blockchain technology, uh, starts uh, as that uh, rarity of, of um, current American life, innovation in telecoms. Uh, Brad was the one who began to realize that there was stuff at Bell Labs that could make money, which uh, turned out not to be what Bell Labs as a whole was very good at doing. Uh, and and uh, he and, and, and Fred Wilson made Union Square Ventures, which um, could make money out of Twitter, uh, for example, which I think Mr. Dorsey's going to have a hard time doing, uh, and uh, has been early in an awful lot of the future we presently have, whether it's Twitter or Foursquare, uh, or for that matter, Coinbase. Uh, Union Square Ventures was there early, and um, I guess it must have gotten out good. Isn't that the whole point? So, so tell us from your point of view, um, where, where are the opportunities now for investment-driven innovation to clarify all of this and, and make some things happen? Where do you think they are and what do you think it's going to be? Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, I think most of the conversation so far has been about the opportunity to use this technology to improve the efficiency of existing organizations and existing business processes. And I think that's a very real opportunity. Um, I had uh, lunch sort of by accident with a senior executive at a major money center bank um, who was very, very actively involved in a blockchain implementation. And he pointed out something really interesting to me. He said that normally in the business cycle, uh, the financial services industry would be consolidating right now very quickly. And they would be doing that because, um, because of the additional capital requirements and regulatory overhead. 
it's becoming more and more difficult to extract uh, margins from proprietary trading and other places that have supported their cost structure. And so there's a lot of pressure on costs now, and a lot of the cost in these, in these businesses is in their back office, in their administration, in their trade settlement. And, and they're looking at those back offices and they're saying, gosh, if we could merge with one of our competitors, we could consolidate that back office. And, um, but Elizabeth Warren is not gonna let us merge with one of our competitors. So how can we, cons how can we get the efficiencies of a consolidated back office without uh, consolidating the front office? And the answer turns out to be it has to be a shared data set, a shared, shared database. And so I don't know if I just lost my mic, but I got it, still here? Still here? Okay, um, so anyway, um, I thought that was a very interesting observation. I think that's a very real opportunity. I think there will be a lot of value created or a lot of efficiencies created um, and, and therefore margins created in existing businesses by sharing that, uh, that, that database across multiple organizations, whether it's a supply chain or a settlement operation. Um, I'm actually personally interested in, in a more disruptive opportunity, one that changes the structure of markets. Um, and I, I'd go back to sort of put this in context to um, you know, the world that existed before the internet. Uh, prior to the internet, um, the media industry was defined by distribution. You had a television station, a radio station, a newspaper. Those distribution channels controlled access to consumers and therefore controlled what the consumers uh, consumed. Then at some point, we all kind of accidentally agreed to communicate with each other directly over a protocol called TCP IP. And all of a sudden, it was possible for anyone to get to anyone else in the world. And those distribution bottlenecks went away overnight. And the, the, there's been a fundamental disruption in the media industry and the telecom industry. Pro people in this room probably remember at some point <coughs> paying for long distance calls. Does anybody remember that? Um, has anybody done that recently? Um, <laughs> So, prisoners, yeah, pri prisoners are the only ones, yeah, actually, paying for long distance calls today. So that there had that that. So what happened there is we moved from a world where telecommunications was controlled by a uh, a corporation, and and the the switching was done through a central switch. And so, in order to connect to somebody across the world, you had to go through a central switch who could extract rents in that process. We moved to a world where we said, well, wait a minute, that's just basically a, 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 a you know, that's a, that's a, that can be reduced to a protocol. We can just define how we're going to exchange messages with each other, and we can load that protocol on every server, and that protocol was called TCP IP, and we loaded that on every server, and all of a sudden, you know, anybody who sent a message from one of those servers to the next, the, the, the packet knew where to go, and it didn't need a central switch. And so, that phenomenon is actually what's happening with the blockchain. Today, you know, we, uh, if, if we think about what's happening in the web today, we're in, a, we're in another era of consolidation. It actually looks to us as investors a lot like the, the world looked in the mid-90s when the first question that you had to ask any potential startup was, how are you going to compete with Microsoft? Today, you have to ask, how are you going to compete with Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon? Uh, and the acronym is now GAFA, if you want to shorten that. So how are you going to compete with GAFA? And, um, and it's, really, it's a very real question, because if you think about what was the last major consumer web service of scale to get to you know, global scale, the answer is Snapchat. Snapchat is now over five years old. There has not been another consumer web service of scale since then. There's a reason for that. Um, there's a reason Twitter today just shut down Vine, their, their video service. Um, there's a reason why companies can't compete with Facebook Live, and it's called a network effect. And the network effect that, that creates the marker power for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon is a result of having the data about all of their consumers in a single place. So the database replaces the central switch that the telecommunications industry had. And so now, the, the profound thing that's happening with the blockchain is the possibility of creating systems where that data is distributed amongst multiple people and no longer concentrated in a single vendor, right? So um, I'll just leave it at that for a moment and say I think that, that, that 
you know, there will be efficiencies created by block pri private blockchains which will, you know, allow existing businesses to become more and more efficient. I think that's great. The more profound change is going to come as public blockchains allow for the disaggregation of market power and the um, reemergence, or what Tim Berners-Lee calls the re-decentralization of the web. Okay, so let's, let's follow that just one more step in the telecommunications sector. FCC is now going to tell the telecoms uh, that they have to get opt-in for the collection of user behavior data. Uh, and uh, what, what I think you just said was, now if we were just a little further along in the maturation of the technologies I want to push, FCC might be in a position to consider another regulatory alternative, which is you can collect that user data only if you're putting it in something which has the anti-competitive and re-decentralizing effect that you're talking about. That is to say, user behavior data can be authenticated information that only exists in a shareable form. You want to get real anarchist about this with me and imagine that that's actually the goal? Or do you want to stop a little bit short of that process in which we, oh, I hate to use this word, socialize all that behavior data in a trustworthy way? So um, I think you're giving uh, Tom Wheeler too much credit. I think he's a very good administrator. I think he's done a very good job of managing uh, a whole bunch of very complex problems, including net neutrality. And I'm very, I, I'm very pleased to have him you know, d do what he has done. And I think that that doing what he's done here um, by requiring the telecommunications industry to tell users when they are basically sitting on their bitstream and mining it for information about their behavior is a good thing. Um, the more interesting longer term prospect is going back to you know what is the nature of network effect market power? And if network effect market power is controlling a central database of you know, of all of this consumer activity, what would happen in a world where consumers had direct access to all the data that was being collected about them? You would essentially invert the market from one where we live, the, the one that we live in today, where consumers go to 20 or 30 different sites, each of which has an incomplete view of them, to one where the consumers create a data store that is a comprehensive data store of their behavior, and 20 or 30 different sites come to that data store on a permission basis. That fundamentally undermines network effect market power and it would allow for the possibility of a, another wave of innovation. If you think about going back to the internet, why Tumblr was able to get to millions, 20 million users in seven or eight months, um, they didn't have to build the telecommunications network, they didn't have to acquire direct, you know, the, the capital cost of getting directly to consumers because we had this shared infrastructure. If we have an infrastructure where there's a decentralized data store where consumers have control over their data and are able to permission uh, service providers to have access to that, you no longer need to get to the scale of a company like Facebook in order to be able to provide services to consumers. You can provide a, a very useful service to a consumer with a single permission from the consumer to have access to that comprehensive data store. So that is fundamentally transformative. That's a big idea, I agree. Um, somebody's gonna make money off that. Of course, uh, Jim Wright, shaking his head up there, knows that Larry Ellison is gonna put that all in one data store that belonged to him, because it's all in, because it's all in his customers' databases as it is right now. Um, in other words, of course, if that doesn't happen, something else will happen. And the something else that will happen is the thing I spend a lot of time in classrooms trying to warn people about, which is the human race will be changed because the network becomes an agent and its so-called network effects are how political power is distributed. You, you, you are, after all, proving what I hoped we could do, which is that anarchism and the, the, the venture capitalist community are, in fact, deeply allied here. The, the, the central idea is the re-decentralization of the web, and Tim's idea is the central idea. You and I both think that, I think. Um, the, the, the question is, how does this technology about shareable forms of self-authenticating information help us to do that? I was reading an interesting paper by some uh, computer scientists uh, at Princeton earlier this week uh, thinking about the use of blockchain-like data storage to replace DNS. 
um, which, after all, is an awfully good idea of a very similar kind, um, uh, which asks us to imagine decentralizing things that otherwise poor Larry Strickling will have to go around lamenting that we cannot decentralize uh, in any acceptable way for the remainder of the millennium, I think. Um, we, we do have lots of ways in which this process of re-decentralization could occur through shareable self-authenticated information, which is blockchains. And whether that's in the supply chain or the way of making free software or uh, the way of collecting consumer information, uh, how the lawyers are going to think all this through in each of their little silos uh, is certainly going to make a difference. Uh, in the sale of financial services, Keith, where, 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 where what, what Chris says is that you really do want to use stuff where the danger of fraud and abuse is present, uh, it might not be a terribly bad idea to make sure that consumers actually could find out how many bank accounts they have at any particular bank and things like that, right? I mean, in the financial services industry, uh, we, have some, we have some reason for that in the same way that in the automotive industry, Jeremiah and I are going to talk about ways in which you know, software cheating can ruin your whole company. Um, as Mr. Stumpf has found out, I think that you know, not keeping two sets of books is a good idea for a bank. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think is the, is the way in which regulators are going to decide that they have a real uh, uh, benefit in that sense from uh, increased integrity from this information? You know, and so I think um, in some part it depends on what regulator you're talking about, right? Different regulators have different objectives, different goals, right? So your question would be probably more of something like what the CFPB would be asking, right? The CFPB, their primary interest is consumer protection. Um, they've pushed you know, a lot of initiatives to make sure there's transparency for consumers. They understand what they're entering into. They understand whether they have one account or two accounts, what the payment terms are. Um, they've really gone after people that have engaged in predatory practices like payday lenders and others, right? And so <clears throat> from their perspective, I think, they look at blockchain as the opportunity to increase transparency for individuals. Um, you know, last week, Cordray is the head of the CFPB. He just gave a you know a, ma a major speech about data aggregation. Kind of who owns the data? Is it the financial institution that owns the data, or is it the customer that owns the data? Which is exactly what you're talking about, right? And his view was, it's the customer. It's the customer's data. So they should be able to take it with them. They should be able to pass the data on to you know, other aggregators like a Mint or an Intuit, those kind of people. Um, they should be able to have other people through APIs access that data. And so I think when you look at it from that perspective, right, they're kind of aligned with you. Take other regulators, take the OCC or the Fed. Again, their primary concern is safety and soundness of the system, not so much the individual, but the system as a whole and how it helps function the economy. Right? It's the Treasury Department that's declared um, financial infrastructure is part of the critical infrastructure in the United States, right? their concern, using the consumer data as the example, is they care less about whether the consumer can access their data, who has it, where does it go. They're more concerned about um, if the data is going to leave, what are the consequences that go with it? So if you're letting data free flow in and out through APIs, for example, does that open up the bank to attack? So I, I think you know, your question really depends on what perspective you're looking well, at. Well, surely they're also going to think, if this is a systemically important institution that can be hit very hard by the, some sales incentives for its retail bankers out of control, then maybe it should also be the case the controller of the currency cares about this at the level of how does bank examination really work and how good are we at testing the internal controls of big institutions before we have to lament that their internal controls weren't good enough by letting senators yell at them or, or something, right? I mean, there, there's, there, there, there's payoff closer to the, to the simple ground of making sure that safety and, and stability exist in the financial system too, right? If, if all that information is out there mineable in close to real time. Chris, I wanted to ask a question about slowing things down which in your presentation is pure technological badness that we should get rid of by better algorithms. And yet I also recognize that one of the things which has happened uh, in, the, in, in the trading system, in the financial trading system of the world is um, uh, what, what, what Brad would call network effects of a different kind. Like I put my servers 
200 nanoseconds <clears throat> closer to the exchange than the other fellow, and I trade fast. When the, when, the, when the length of time that a share of stock is held on the New York Stock Exchange converges towards 22 seconds, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea if settlement speed went down in the technology of transacting. Is it possible that actually one of the things we get when we get shareable self-authenticated information is that we return to better rather than worse timescales in some forms of trading? Is it always true that the faster clearing is the most important technological objective? As I was listening to you, I was thinking to myself, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's an important enough idea nowadays that if you say, I'm going to have a new fully automated stock exchange and I'm going to have a speed bump in it, people think that might be a selling point. What is the... What is the real? ECC thinks that. Yeah. Well, so so that is the real. So that is the real question in a way, which in a, in a sense, Brad seems to me to be opening up again. Redecentralization also means decentralizing settlement in some important ways yeah. that might actually take valuable and salutary time and reduce flash crashes and other internet-enabled pathologies in the financial system. Yeah, so it's, it's actually, there, there's an interesting dynamic going on, I think, because of the, um, the, disruption, the, the disruptive nature of the technology and the disintermediation that has, the potential for disintermediation that there is, there exists, is that those like DTCC and CME and SWIFT and so forth are, if they're enlightened, they're having a very close look at this and trying to get their heads around it and if they're, uh, for, from my perspective, if they're smart, then they are looking at how they reinvent themselves because they will be disintermediated eventually if they aren't an active participant in helping to sort of move things forward. Now, to your point, does it make sense to have speed bumps? And I think that's, that's entirely possible. But again, it's going to depend on the nature of the type of use that you may want to bring this technology um, my, in terms of slowing down, I think <laughs> just in, in order to, to develop this software, and this is my problem, is we're you know trying to do this, uh, and I'm sure Ginny wouldn't want me to say this, but we need to slow down because we don't want to put stuff out that has the potential for oops, you know, I mean that's just not cool. And so in the rush to getting you know software in place that we can use to do whatever it is. I think we need to be very deliberate and careful about this because you know if you put something in place that's intended to last for 20 years and you forgot to put in the provision for well how do I update it right oops right or if you put in software that's got an inherent bug like the DAO and you rush to get something into production the way that they did without fixing it another oops and you don't want those cuz you want to talk about the investment risk of that No I, I I want to talk about that you know that that problem. I think that that uh, it makes perfect sense that somebody in IBM or Bank of America's position would never want to put out a piece of code that could be hacked the way the DAO was hacked, and that that would be a huge brand risk. Um, and I also think that that one of the great opportunities for established institutions here is to be the backup version of trust in in these systems, and so. Um, you know, to provide a kind of insurance that will make people comfortable. I mean, remember how hard it was to get people to put credit cards into e-commerce sites, right? If, well, the reason people started doing it is because Visa and MasterCard and American Express said, go ahead, you know, we'll cover you. And so if, I think there will be a very important opportunity for these established institutions with established, you know, 100-year-old brands to say, Okay, um, go ahead. We'll we'll cover this because as long as you're you know within our you know private blockchain, for instance, you know we'll cover you. However, that's not what open source has been about, right? I mean, <clears throat> open source has been put it out there, get it hacked, you know, get get it fixed, and keep moving forward. But there's a new th phenomenon here that I don't think we I I certainly have never seen before. And that is that um, there's a token that represents the value of the ecosystem that's being created in this open source world. I had somebody tell me the other day that this is the first time that open source has had its own business model. Um, so if you're two or three guys or gals who create a piece of code that, that defines a way in which 
decentralized parties can interact with each other. Think of it as a blockchain of some kind. Um, and you uh, issue a token that is used as a, as a way of um, recording and managing transactions within that system, but also has a independent currency value that's a reflection of how much that system is being used. Um, as the use of that system grows, the value of the token grows because there's a, usually a limited number of them that are created, and, and they need to be used in order to execute transactions within the system, so there's just a natural supply and demand that increases the value of the tokens. So if you're one of the first people, and you know you mentioned uh, Satoshi, um, it would be it would it would explain something if your friend is who's now dead. I didn't know this was um, well it was no, right. No, no, no. Finney is dead. How, we don't know whether we know that how Finney we we know that how Finney is dead. So one of the things about Satoshi is that he is sitting on three hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and they have never shown up on the network. And they would because it's a transparent network. We would know when Satoshi starts to spend his $300 million. Well, he was the originator of the paper. He was the origin. He created this token. So now we have this weird situation where the value of the token that represents the value of the ecosystem um, can grow um, and independent of the value of the businesses that may be built on top of it. So it's, it's kind of a brave new world. So I thought I heard you say that, there, that open source now has two business models. That is to say there's the old one and then there's the one where the venture capitalists that fund them also invest in the tokens, right? You have two ways to be in. You can have a position in the tokens and a position in the operation of the business. Right. So just to, just to be clear that those two may be inversely related to each other. Um, so if you go back to, um, you know, if you create a, if you create a system that um, that is is that has a protocol that operates within the system it has a protocol with a token and the token represents uh, value within the system say it's a storage system and every time somebody in this decentralized storage system agrees to take a few bits for you they they earn a few tokens so that token is the currency w within that contained system um, and and it appreciates over time um, if I want to invest in the company, that that built that system, and I want to invest in the equity of the company. Um, in order for the equity of the company to be to be valuable, then the the company has to retain a significant portion of the tokens. But if I am an open source contributor and I'm contributing uh, storage capacity on the network and I'm participating in this, I don't see any reason to to create value for the shareholders. I want to I, I want to invest in the network, and I invest in the network by investing in the token. So, if the company hoards a significant portion of the tokens, it's likely that the network is not going to be successful um, because people aren't going to agree to share, you know, to contribute to the value of the network. Um, so. It's a really tricky problem because I think that that it may be possible that in some of these worlds, um, the tokens will be significantly more valuable than the equity. Yeah, and this is actually a sort of an intersection of, uh, and I, I kind of touched on it, but I'll sort of elaborate. And that is that you look at something like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is essentially, by its very nature, it's a deflationary system. The value of the Bitcoin is always trending downward um, because there are more. Bitcoin's generated all the time. Um, and uh, and when you generate it and in a deflation, you want to sell it as quickly as possible if you're mining them. Uh, now, that, that that keeps it afloat a little bit, but basically there's it's that equilibrium or that balance between hoarding or holding on to some set and also spending them that you have to achieve to make this thing sort of really sort of, you know, the Goldilocks, you know, or the... Um, uh, you know, just right. You know, the 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 the, the porch that's just right. Um, and I think that's what everybody is sort of, you know, that's the the golden goose that everybody's looking for right now is what is that balance of proof of work and proof of stake that's necessary to have one of these systems actually achieve equilibrium. Uh, Keith, do 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 banks want this to kill money or support money? I, there's a difference of opinion down at the other end about whether this is going to replace 
money and you're going to want to do proprietary <coughs> trading in tokens or whether it's about operational improvements in the productivity of, uh, of lending money. Which, which way do you think uh, Bank of America faces at the moment? Um, if, 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 if Chris is allowed to say things that Ginny doesn't want said, then um, maybe you can too. So, you know, I thought the, the discussion was interesting. It started sounding a lot like some synthetic derivatives that happened in the, in does, the, in the, in the late... It, it does, doesn't uh, it? The, That's why I'm asking yeah, you. Yeah, you it know, sounds a lot like that. Sticks, yeah. um, <laughs> but, you know, and we'll let the venture capitalists deal with that. We had our fun with that ah, uh, 10 years ago. But, but I think in terms of the, um, <clears throat> you know, where does banking, you know, where does this fit in? Um, you know, I think it fits in a couple different places. I think, you know, to some extent, it is about, you know, how do you make these transactions more efficient, how do you, you know, which obviously lowers cost to the bank, but it also makes funds available. It lowers the fees, right? You take out the intermediaries, you take out a DTCC, for example, you're going to dramatically lower the costs to the consumers as well. So I think in some, in some ways, right, there's, there's an alignment there um, <clears throat> between efficiencies in operations and benefit for the customer. I think we start getting into some of the more, you know, synthetic issues with the tokens and the independent value of the tokens versus the equities. Um, you know, I think Dodd Frank has largely taken care of that from the bank perspective in terms of playing in that space. Okay, so then I so then I want to be less synthetic, and I want to mention a real entity again called China. Um, actually, I, I I want to start with other real entities like Bangladesh. So you say, if SWIFT is sophisticated, it will be thinking heavily about this, and whether SWIFT is or isn't sort of depends upon which end of the SWIFT network we're talking about. Um, but, but surely we all recognize that we now live in a world in which existing forms of um, uh, fina global finance through the net are in yeah. significant danger of falling over one day from, uh, I guess, people's IoT cameras and such, and possibly even more dangerous right. instruments. Um, safety and security is a real issue about all this. Yes, you don't want to issue any code that blows up the the world of the IBM I went to work for in 1979 did not bid on air traffic control technology because it actually thought it would rather not be the one responsible Seats. right and 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 that surely is true when we go to improving the safety and security of the world banking system there would be a lot of money in it but there's also a lot of ways to lose things. Back when we were doing PGP in the early 90s, we, we knew that there was a presentation for the White House incoming uh, 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 president and vice president of the United States about how, well, you know, if we, could, didn't, if we couldn't listen to everything, nuclear war, explosion would have happened in Detroit. We weren't allowed to get the briefing, as it used to be called, because we weren't uh, subject to clearance. Uh, and, and my anarchist friends and I, we prepared an alternate briefing for the White House in the 90s, and we said, so good morning, Mr. President. Uh, owing to a backdoor in the world financial system nobody knew was there, $6 trillion disappeared overnight. The market's open in 15 minutes. What do you want to do? Uh, and oddly enough, although we now have crypto that everybody can use to keep everything very secret, we're not further from that particular midnight than we were back then. Um, do, do, do the people uh, worrying about cybersecurity for what lawyers uh, what lawyers need to know about cybersecurity down the hall is blockchain part of the answer to that question? From the point of view of, of Bank of America and other people with a lot at risk, if the network tilts over, is this part of the solution to long-term survivability? So, yes, I think um, you know, you look at kind of where we've evolved in terms of cybersecurity. I think. Going back five or six years, it was, let's stop it, right? Let's stop the attack. Let's stop the hack. Having gone through a series of high-profile attacks, whether it's, you know, Home Depot, Target, Dairy Queen, Sony, you name them, I think there's people are becoming a little more realistic about the prospects of, of this, and they realize, yes, let's stop it, but we're not going to stop them all. And so how do you deal with the, the resiliency component of it? Um, I think, you know, so in that sense, yes, I think, um, you know, again, you look at, the recent cyber proposal that came out last week from the federal regulators, right? One of the proposals is they basically want immutable data. You can recover, you can pass that data to another financial institution. If you're down, they can kind of pick up where you've left off, right? I think blockchain absolutely could be a, hu a huge piece of that, that solution. At the same time, though, I think the flip side on the cyber piece is if everything goes blockchain, 
if every payment, every settlement goes blockchain, right now you have proprietary systems that are all unique, they're all different, right? If everything goes blockchain, does that then open it up for, that becomes a very attractive target for a nation state or a terrorist organization. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Yeah, in fact, I was, I was watching the news last night and I got to my hotel room and you know, they're talking about uh, you know, the, the, the Russian hacks on some of the voting uh, uh, registration systems and I can't remember which states it was. And I was just thinking, oh, well, you, know, you could just apply blockchain to that and you wouldn't have this problem because you'd have replicated data everywhere. And so despite the fact that somebody might have gone in and tried to compromise one of those databases, the other ones would say, no, 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 that didn't happen. But by the same token, if they actually can compromise that network and start issuing transactions, well, then they could. So I, I, again, I th and, and, and I, I'm thinking back to, you know, the Ethereum recently had their, you know, sort of DevCon in, in Shanghai uh, last month and, and, and they were being hacked while they had their sort of annual conference because they could, you know, and because there's some value there and, and by essentially amounting a denial, a distributed denial of service attack on the Ethereum public network, they can devalue the currency and so forth. So I, I would have to say, again, it, it, you know, we need to sort of take it slowly and deliberately and think through these things because you know, it would be really unfortunate if we, you know, did something like put all of our marbles into a blockchain basket that, that then could be compromised. Uh, Creates you know. trust, but requires <clears throat> trust. Requires it. And, and that's why it, we... And, and intergovernmental right. and international circumstances may not provide right. the requisite degrees of trust, hence your comment about other people's Bitcoin mining. Right. Brad, and, what... And, and, but again, that, that's really why sort of private blockchains are probably the right thing for the first three to five years as we start sorting this out and really figuring out the technology and understanding how, um, how it can and should be used. I, I didn't expect you to agree with that. What would, what, what so, would you, you know, I, I, mean, I, I mean, the question about whether private blockchains are the right answer is, you know, is, is the question that you always pose to software. Is it, you know, is, is it better to have fewer people hacking on it or more people hacking on it? I usually you, you think it's better to have more people hacking on it. I think the question about resiliency of blockchains gets you to a question about how many of them will there be. Um, and one of the reasons that Bitcoin today is, you know, the market cap of Bitcoin is about $10 billion, the market cap of Ethereum is about a billion dollars, and then after that it falls off to very small numbers. You know, you're talking about new coins being issued that have market caps of 100 million or 5 million, right? Well, why is there a difference? The difference is that you know, people have tried to hack Bitcoin for 10 years, and they haven't yet figured out how to break it. Um, the, the, the hack on the DAO actually didn't break Ethereum. It broke the DAO. Uh, it broke the, smart, broke the smart contract and Ethereum underneath it. So, so that tend, you know, the, the fact, you know, so there are a couple of different more subtle kinds of network effects that exist within these blockchains that, t that may tend towards a small number of large blockchains. Um, and, um, and, and it's, you know, it's the fact that I know how to program in this environment. I can teach the guy next to me how to program in this environment. It's the fact that it's been tested and pushed. Um, and those, that may, that may lead to a concentration. What, what we're thinking right now is that it's likely to end up as looking something like an inverted pyramid where there's a small number of relatively large, robust, well-tested blockchains at the bottom. And then people... Instead of spinning up a new blockchain to create a new service, they, they, they rely on the underlying blockchain. And so there are a number of services that obviously have been built on top of Ethereum. And then there's a number of uh, services that, that are actually porting the Ethereum smart contract uh, platform to the Bitcoin blockchain. And, so, and then you'll, you'll get services built on top of that. So I think that... Um, the resiliency is ultimately going to be a factor of, you know, the, of how that inver inverted pyramid works and whether the attacks happen on the base or in the middle or at the top and, you know, and, and whether we need to have multiple p perhaps replicated blockchains at the bottom um, in order to give us the sense of confidence that we need. Chris, one of the things that, that, that will happen is as this type of software proliferates, as this paradigm proliferates, it will wind up being used by the entities that consume most of the software in the world, which are governments. 
And one of the things we're going to be asking about is public records in this form. As far as I know at the moment, there are 49 states in the United States that are completely uninterested in this subject altogether. And that great fintech capital among the states, Vermont, is the only place in which uh, the issue of the admissibility of uh, blockchain-related records as evidence in courts is presently a subject of legislative discussion. But as your use cases point out, more than just money, this is property. That is to say records. That is to say public goods. Yep which are now going to come to be seen as better or not better in this form. L land records, you said, yes, right. that's right. Repo agreements, yes, that's right. Voting records and voting behavior, yes, that could happen. Yeah. Um, but also, pretty much, all the other forms uh, in which government either creates or consumes evidence. Um, if your view is that we, we need to stay private for a while until we know that this really works, when in, the, in, in, that, in that, that horizon of, of change that, that you're busy trying to create, when do we get to the point where this is what we think evidence is, where public data authenticates itself this way and we right. live in a blockchain governance of yet another kind? So I think it's important to just to discriminate between a private network being something that nobody can see as opposed to something that is uh, has a limited participation. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a, a private club, right? Everybody can see the front door to a private club. They know it's there, but they're not members. They're not welcome. Um, uh, and that's really what we're talking about when I talk about like a private blockchain. I'm not talking about something that's hidden. So it could be that it's visible, that people can have visibility into a private blockchain, but the members of that blockchain is a closed set. So if we think about something like voting records, then you could have, in any given state, the members of that blockchain could be all the counties in that state, right? And they're sharing the records of deed, you know, the registry of deeds and the voting rolls and so forth um, amongst that small set of known, authenticated participants in that network um, that trust each other, right? Um, and everybody can have an account that can let them go in and see, but maybe they can't actually interact and, and cause transactions except through you know, some, some application or some, some, some uh, uh, function of the government itself. And then we go one step further when the courts actually have to decide, is this how you prove things? Because that moment up until that point, we might have been saying we do all that and then we keep the pencil and paper back up and if we have to prove a thing, that's how we prove it. Or we might be saying, well, you know, that smart contract, that's all very nice, but could we see ink on, you know, paper somewhere? Uh, um, or we could get to the point where what we have decided is we have enough trust built up in the technology that that is actually how we declare that things are proved. Uh, educational records is not a terribly bad example, right? I mean, obviously, there is a club of universities in, the, in New York State with the authority to grant degrees, and they are the people who can put stuff on transcripts. Uh, and then there are the employers who want to look at them. But then there's that last question about how do you prove uh, that you got a PhD from Columbia University in such a year. Or, and, and, and from Brad's point of view, I think the point about that is that's a business to be in, causing people to have confidence in those platforms of sharing. Uh, and I do see a public competitor, that is to say the thing we call the judicial system, which ultimately determines what constitutes evidence. And I'm wondering again about sequencing. So I, I want to... Um take it up a level uh, and, and not talk about the state of Vermont. Um, you mentioned Estonia. Um, we had the CTO of the country of Estonia come by the other day, and he said something that just blew my mind. Um, one of the, in, Evan, I think you probably know more about this experiment than I do, but they are experimenting with something called digital citizenship. Um, they have created the ability to become a citizen of a country without actually ever setting foot in that country and, and having an identity that's maintained by the country, sanctioned by the country, verified by the country. Um, and um, and, and I'm th we're thinking, okay, that's cute. It's a toy. It's, you know, it's a neat idea, but I mean, what, what's the real thing here? 
And what he said that blew me away was, you don't understand, Estonia was recently a Russian you know, state. Um, and we live in fear, and the Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine is a real example for them, that we may once again be overrun by the Russians. By moving our state to the blockchain, we are making ourselves resilient in the face of being overrun physically. That blew my mind. So William III told the Dutch when uh, Louis XIV was coming for them once that they, they had enough shipping in their harbors. They could put all of Holland on boats and go and start another Holland in the South Seas. Uh, and, and my friends whose Yugoslavia was destroyed in the early 90s, many of them who considered themselves Yugoslav citizens of a place that didn't exist anymore wanted to make cyber you and co have continuity that way. So, 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 so facing this as a kind of national resiliency, it, it, it seemed to you like a, a credible prospect, right? A, a Stalin would say, yeah, but, the, but socialism is where the Red Army stands. And uh, I, I think meat space still has some you know, priority in that sense. But that ability to create identity or to run a national ratings system to attach the money to the behavior patterns. To it. Is this why the Chinese Bitcoin mining bothers you, or is it just that if they had 51%, they could rewrite transaction history? It's history, not just transaction history, which is at stake right, in, in Brad's example, right? This is, this is national identity and the flow of history and the question of who gets to rewrite that. When, when I think about those public records becoming evidence, when, when, when I think about the, the long flow of the land law from the 11th century version that I teach in medieval English legal history in which we don't have any central records and we're never going to have them. You, you prove ownership by getting the vill to come around and say, we remember when it was transacted. All the way to the point at which self-authenticating databases that don't rest in a safe in the county clerk's office, but are all over the net, but they're protected by wonderful encryption. Trust us, large numbers are really hard to factor in polynomial time. Um, this, this, this changes the nature of how human beings think about memory and record keeping. And if Brad is going to take it up a level, we need to go all the way to the top of that. We're really talking about how we remember things. Uh, that my, 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 my friend, Mr. Wright, works for a man who built buildings that looked like disk drives because the way we remember things is we put them in Oracle. Uh, and, and that was the paradigm of a type of software, and it made a ton of money for the guy. Um, now we're going to remember things a different way, and we're going to be both require trust and create trust. And at some point, we're going to trust everything we own to it, and we're going to have to believe. Um, it all does depend upon some math. And, and the idea that it is hard to break that crypto. Um, and and my, my friends in the anarchist cypherpunk world, they're already trying to go post-quantum with chips they can bake in their toaster ovens because they're not quite so sure of that math anymore. How do you, how do you feel about the lifespan of the math everything depends upon? So I, I'm not the crypto guy. Um. <laughs> Ah, but, but you are the crypto guy, whether yeah, you like it well, or not, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I am. And I think that, you know, again, we have, we have an awful lot of uh, things to go through, again, if we're thinking about systems that are going to have longevity in 20, 30, 50, 70, 100 years from now. Is that the right more. time scale? Can hmm? we do that? Can we make well, software that will be good in this area 70 years from now? I, I think it's, it's a good question. I mean, right now, you know, when you issue a certificate, it has an expiry. Right? We do that for a reason. And so, okay, so if I've signed something and put that into the blockchain and my certificate expires, is the court going to recognize that? Or are they going to recognize that it's an expired certificate? How do you prove that that was correct then? Right? So I think we, I, again, <laughs> it's just, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm out on the, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very sort of, um, uh, aggressive when it comes to technology, but I think as you then think about what are you going to do with it, you have to be very, very, you, you have to be very thoughtful about what and how these systems are going to last 
And uh, I don't think there are any easy answers. An absolutely unique instance where the, the, the engineers are cautious and the lawyers want to jump ahead. Right? Well, and, and I think just going back to your crypto point, though, right, and, and it kind of brings it all back to cybersecurity, which is maybe today it's secure because of the cryptography, but at some point the computing power will get such that it will no longer be secure. So by definition, you're going to have a, a finite shelf life because you're going to have to... Or a exactly. paradigm and shift. Then, but, I mean, yeah. but then it's a matter, again, if you have a long-lived system, what, do I have to re-sign it with my new key? You know, oh, yeah, but, or what, a paradigm you know, shift in hardware means Shah, that you know, your software 20, paradigm 48, has right? you know, fallen over. To, yes, right. Well, but, if we could really, but if we could really factor large numbers in non-polynomial time, then I don't care which one so you're the, using. So the problem is, um, is, is not that we're going to have quantum... Um, in quantum computing, in quantum computing, it's going to break all of the encryption that is currently used in all of the blockchains, right? That's right. going to happen, right? Yes. So, but that's not the problem. No, the reason oh, that's good. not the problem is that uh, the question is how does how do these systems evolve, and that gets you back to this question of governance. And I think the DAO is an interesting example. What happened? Uh, which Chris talked about was um, when when the DAO was hacked, the Ethereum community forked the entire um, you know blockchain and started you know essentially a new blockchain that rolled back that set of transactions and went off on their own. Um, well, there is still a remaining uh, called Ethereum Classic people who said no no we don't agree with that fork um, and we're gonna we believe that code is law. And that the guy didn't do anything wrong. We told you there was a flaw in the code. You didn't fix it. So boom, you're, we're over here. Well, the Ethereum, the fork, is got about a billion dollar market cap, and the Ethereum Classic has about a hundred million dollar market cap. So it's not nothing, um, but it's basically people voting for you know which of these two governance models. But we end up in this really interesting problem in that you concentrate. You know, the question is, how do you when, when quantum computing happens, how do you jump from one blockchain to the new blockchain encrypted by quantum encryption? Um, and, and what is the governance system that gives you confidence that you're going to do that? Is it you know, the, the majority of the people who own the coins? Or, you know, and, and you know, democracy is not looking so good in our world right now, so maybe democracy is not what you want. Maybe you want Linus Torvalds to say, guys, it's time to go to the next you know, blockchain. Uh, that would be a benevolent dictator. Maybe you want something in between, but um, you know the what when when we have that break, the the problem is not going to be technology; it's going to be governance. No, I no, I, I I think this is an obvious moment for explaining how Brad and I get to be in the two rather different circumstances of the world that we are, because uh, he thinks of those Ethereum forks as having certain market caps. And without personally describing which of those two forks it is, I will tell you that whichever one it is, whatever market cap it has, it still pays its lawyers zero. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we, so there's something definitely wrong with me, anyway. Um, so let's get some more voices into this. Who wants to uh, ask a, a, a really large and complicated softball question of the kind that, uh, that I, I'm unwilling to ask? Uh, Michael, you take this one. I, I'm, I'm not Yeah. Oh, Wendy, go ahead. <laughs> um, thanks. So, so, so I'm here from the World Wide Web Consortium where we uh, look at a different type of consensus, the sort of social and technical consensus around uh, standards for interoperability for the web. And uh, that's a funny and messy process of bringing people together to agree on what's needed to interoperate without getting into such detail that we just end up bickering about the things that don't matter while uh, people building things uh, go off in front. Well, that, that <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. So, so well, I, I'm coming here as the uh, less than a month in uh, strategy lead for W3C, so I get to look at the big questions of uh, how do we uh, how do we help the world and how do we help the web? Uh, so one of those questions is, is there something uh, that the, the users of blockchain need that, that standards uh, can provide that, that we uh, can help in, in a governance mode? So I, I used to do a lot of work at the W3C. Uh, I know Danny remembers. Um, and uh, I think the answer to that is, is yes, but I, uh, it's not clear to me 
um, whether or not we're at a point in time when we're ready to actually have standards. I think it's useful to start thinking about this. Um, so one area is interoperability, right? So if we have all these blockchains and there's all these different implementations, you have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum, you have Hyperledger Fabric, you have Sawtooth, you have you know, Quora, uh, Quorum and you have Quarta, whatever, there inevitably will come a time when these things need to be able to talk to one another. We need to, we, you know, we need to be able to potentially have one blockchain talk to another blockchain and exchange transactions of some nature. Um, and so I know that there's a, currently a community group uh, at W3C that's looking at, uh, I think they call it interledger protocols. And so the, the, this notion of being able to have uh, token you know, trans and a transaction transcend any one blockchain network into another. Uh, that's very simple with something like payments because you're dealing with, you know, very uh, straightforward transactions. Uh, you can probably put, you know, a specific uh, data model around that and, um, uh, and, and have that transcend any one particular blockchain. Um, when you're looking at various other types of use cases, though, then the data models become really sort of um, uh, independent of the blockchain itself, and interoperability is then going to be based on well, how are we exchanging those data models? And that is, I think, uh, where you know the W3C and the likes can come into play in terms of defining, just as we did back in the SOAP and Web Services days of defining, you know, these XML uh, or you know JSON or whatever it is at any given time. Uh, uh, models for any particular type of data. I think that um, those things are still going to be vitally important as we roll out different blockchains that have different data models behind them, um, that we be able to exchange data freely between them uh, is, is going to be vitally important. Um, but in terms of standards for blockchain itself, I've been, and, and again, I've been doing standards for, you know, almost 20 years, so... <laughs> I'm, I, I'm from that world, but I think that we want to make sure that we're not standardizing things too soon that stifles the technology and the evolution, because as I mentioned, the, the, there are some extraordinarily complex computer science problems that we're trying to solve, and if we harden them on some piece of paper that everybody goes humana humana over uh, too soon, then we aren't able to sort of move beyond where we are today. I think just to kind of add to that a little bit, so whenever the time is right, we'll leave it at the computer scientist people, but um, you know, we've been talking a lot about with blockchain, a lot of the different applications, a lot of them in finance and others. I think one of the things that's important in terms of the, the standard setting is that it's not just technical people, right? You need people that have a deep understanding of finance or payments or economics or some of these other use cases that we've been talking about because you know, it's not like a web browser or DVD, right? There's, there's a lot of other ramifications. I think it's important that you do bring that, the full expertise. Um, thanks, everyone. It's a great panel. Uh, I, I want to ask a question that I was prompted, Brad, by your the analogy that you proposed, which is that um, I think this compelling analogy between what the telecom system was like and then what happened when you put uh, TCP IP uh, capabilities on essentially every connected host. And I think you're trying, you're saying, well, you take the kind of network effect of personal data that's held in these centralized stores and you move it, uh, perhaps with something like a blockchain, uh, in, into a protocol. Um, and I guess the, the question I have is about simplicity and scalability. I mean, it seems like the combination of TCP IP, and I would, of course, add HTTP, was was extraordinary because it was so simple and, and in a lot of ways horrible. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it meant that people like Chris then had, you know, decades of work to do to add capabilities that normal systems had, <laughs> like state and whatever else, right? Um, um, but, you know, it, there was a sweet spot there, I think you'd agree, in in, in simplicity and scalability. And it it, it strikes me that the challenge that blockchain is sort of illuminating is this is m more complicated, right? I mean, the, the, the kind of social mechanism that everyone here is trying to instantiate in a protocol as opposed to the messiness of human and institutional interactions is, um, is somewhat more complicated than, um, you know, the, the incredibly simple uh, uh, set of, of behaviors that TCPIP can can um, can model. I'm just interested in how you think about what we do about that. 
I, I think that's actually a good point because when you think about TCP IP, it's pretty much send receive, right? I mean, that's it's that simple. Um, and when I think about applying blockchain and distributed ledger technology to any given solution domain, uh, then there's the whole, what are you building on top of it? And how are you using that? And it's not a simple send receive. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. It depends on what type of consensus model are you using and you know, how are you storing the data? Are you encrypting it? How are you sharing it? Are you, you know, uh, uh, are you sharing it globally? Or are you sharing it only with you know, select partners? And so it's going to be a little bit more complicated to write these types of systems. And again, I do think that over time it's going to take you know, a, a, a body of work to build up best practices and patterns of use of blockchain and distributed ledger technology just as we did with, you know, Corba and, you know, web services and, you know, now REST and JSON and so forth, that, the, you, know, you know, Roy's paper was, you know, fantastic, but it's taken people 10 years to really sort of reason about it and, and, and actually start producing systems um, in, in a way that we can, you know, easily just sort of come to market with them. So I think the same thing's gonna happen over time. I, I think, you know, we'll have enough, a lot of proof of concepts that, you know, evolve into a production system in the next years. Um, but I do think that there's still going to be a, 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 a time period of three to five years while people sort of get their heads wrapped around it and figure out what to do with it and figure out what not to do with it in particular. Danny, on the basis of that question, can I ask a question back? Uh, so, so I'm a law professor. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it works, right? But it, it's okay. I mean, so, 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 so I remember the night when you said to me, during a time when there was a thing called SOPA, and you said, you know, I think the White House now really understands DNS for the first time ever. The last two digits of that year, of course, were 12, I think. Um, so you so so you said this is going to be more complicated, and that means it's going to be a real challenge to the policy process. And Keith thinks of that as about Richard Cordray because he has to think about Richard Cordray a lot. But but what do you think is the next? Uh, assuming that the next government of the United States is rational and that it conducts policy making and that you're going to assure us of at the end of today, right? Well, I, I, <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, there is an elephant in the room. Let me put it that way. Uh, assuming rationality in that sense, it, it, three to five years sounds roughly right for what Chris is talking about, which is just sort of making the engineers c feel confident in details. What, what do you think? Is the, at the end of that time, is this still going to be somewhere down in the Treasury Department because this is all about fintech, or is somebody from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy going to be thinking about this at the end of the next president's? So, so the reason I asked my question, which is really about. Um, uh, Brad's view is that I think what's what to me is quite exciting about this is it does address the core Elizabeth Warren problem of concentration and centralization and even my very esteemed colleague um, the chair of the National Economic Council Jason Furman who's a pretty cautious economist said the biggest drag on growth in this country is concentration in markets um, and that I think is an extraordinary statement and I think so I, I tend to think money works okay. I mean, I, and I, I take your point that, that you could make it work better and cheaper and you can settle more efficiently and all that, but I think the question that I believe regulators and policymakers are gonna ask is uh, do we have another uh, option to really open up markets? Because that's what's gonna transform, that's what's gonna get us out of our sort of sad state of growth uh, um, and and also is going to answer the question about these you know these big 10 companies that even the economist is now writing about saying maybe they're too big um, so I, I think that's where the policymakers I agree hundred percent as to the financial services regulators uh, with with Keith but I think the broader economic policy is, is going to be about this decentralization so I think we do, um, but I think that that we are at in danger of you know sort of bringing the entire discussion to a grinding halt if we try and solve too big a problem too early. So I think Chris's observation is 100% correct that that you know we're now talking about the possibility of restructuring you know very complicated systems and 
you know, you can get into a discussion that goes all the way up to the applications layer, and 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 you know, there's just no way to resolve that. But if you go back to TCP/IP, send, receive, right, and then you just move up one layer to the data layer, and you say store, don't store, right, and don't try and solve all of those other problems. If you just enable that data layer and you don't squash it, then I think we may end up with this really interesting balance between you know, a market system that, that actually tends in, the, in a positive direction instead of one that tends in a negative direction without having to prescriptively define exactly how it's going to work. Yeah, and, and the trick is going to be getting to Elizabeth Warren and saying, look, yeah, this is scary, it's, it's, it's anarchist, it's unregulated, um, but, you know, don't, you know, but it is your friend in the end, and you need to recognize it as your friend. I never thought I would live to hear a Harvard bankruptcy professor described in these extraordinary, <laughs> it just shows how people can change. Um, is there somebody here who would like to delay everybody else's lunch to ask one really smart question? I would love that to happen. Uh, please, yes, Scott, go ahead. Ha hand the man a microphone. Um, and, uh, All right, I, everybody, I promise I'll be quick here. But uh, um, so it's really, this is a fan fascinating topic and um, kind of leaves me with a lot of hope, but also a lot of abject terror. Um, We're so doing our jobs. It's yeah, yeah you're doing your that job, right. You so, <laughs> so, so this is probably a question for, for Evan and for Chris. But if the assumption is that eventually, you know, quantum computing and whoever knows what the, the next stage is past that is eventually going to break all the hashes that we're using to verify the trust in the transactions. How do you keep ahead of this so you don't have to reestablish all the accumulated value that we would build into, say, a 25-year blockchain? Is it just a matter of, of an arms race to, to keep ahead of being broken? Or what is there something intrinsic in the system that can help protect against this? You're not the crypto guy, so you need so to answer yeah, the question. I, I, I don't... Yeah. So I, you know, not getting into sort of how to solve that problem, but uh, it, the the notion of it being sort of a constant arms race, I, I think that, again, you know, and this is, I think, one of the fundamental reasons why we so strongly believe that this needs to be technology that is not controlled or owned by anyone, but that's a community shared asset that we all collaborate on building. And that is because while we may start things that have to last for 25, 30 years, this, this technology has to evolve mm -hmm. over that period of time. So it's gotta be a, li it's a living thing. And, and, and so in, in, the, in that regard, yeah, it'll, it'll be constantly adapting to whatever the current state of technology is. And if we need to have stronger crypto, we get stronger crypto. If we need to think about other approaches because nobody can out, you know, uh, you know out, out, out com compute a, a quantum computer, well, then we have to go back to square one and rethink some of these things. But um, uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think, you know, again, it, it requires that we bring everybody together, get all the smart people in the room. I, you know, I used to work at Sun. That's why I could make fun of the, the Sun jokes a little bit earlier. But I mean, you know, the network is a computer. And Bill Joy had this saying. He basically said that no matter who you are, how many, how many smart people you employ, there are more smart people that work for somebody else. When you can get all of those people collaborating together out in the open, that, that's the winning game right there. So, yeah, but, so Bill Joy, but Bill Joy was right that those people are disadvantaged because all the people who work somewhere else are using PowerPoint. You have to admit that he, <laughs> he, he knew something about all that. So could we have a round of applause for the smart people in the room? Uh, you heard it here first. I, maybe none of us understood it, but you heard it here first. And, and everybody's going to be hearing about it later, you can be sure. Um, my thanks to the Open Invention Network and to Qualcomm Technology Industries for helping me to deliver you free lunch. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, enough time for eating and networking and talking. And we will resume here to discuss automobiles uh, at 1.30. Don't touch that dial. Bye-bye.